asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Well, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, has written a column in the Evening Standard, <laughs> which, of course, is edited these days by none other than Gideon George Osborne. Why? Why is that? Well, Jeremy is meeting Jewish leaders today to apologise for not tackling anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And as I understand it, he is still in conversation with Jewish leaders in Westminster right now. They might have broken up, they might not, they might still be speaking, I don't know. But he wrote a piece for the Evening Standard in advance of his meeting with Jewish leaders. Let me read some of it for you. The headline was, Jeremy Corbyn, what I'm doing to banish anti-Semitism from the Labour Party. And there were one or two interesting quatrains. <laughs> there aren't quatrains, he's not Nostradamus. There were one or two interesting paragraphs in his article, which I think we should have a look at. So he says at the beginning the usual stuff, anti-Semitism is a poison, it must be challenged, hatred and bigotry is no place towards Jewish people or anybody else in our society, that goes for the Labour Party. I'm meeting with the Board of Deputies of British Jews and the Jewish Leadership Council to discuss working together to tackle old and new forms of anti-Semitism. We have a particular duty to lead the fight against anti-Semitism, he says. Jews have found a natural home in the Labour Party since its foundation. And Jews have been central to our movement, he said. We have a long and proud record of standing against anti-Semitism, blah, 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 blah. But then he goes on to write, but we must also face the uncomfortable fact that a small number of our members and supporters hold anti-Semitic views and attitudes which needs to be confronted and dealt with more rapidly and effectively. Then he goes on to say, listen up, he says, the evidence is clear enough, he says. Labour staff have seen examples of Holocaust denial, crude stereotypes of Jewish bankers, conspiracy theories blaming 9-11 on Israel, and even one member who appeared to believe that Hitler had been misunderstood. We are taking action, wrote Jeremy Corbyn. In the past fortnight, more than 20 individuals have been suspended. But we have not done enough to get to grips with the problem. The Jewish community and our Jewish members deserve an apology. My party and I are sorry for the hurt and distress caused. Right. He said in his letter to the Board of Deputies and the Jewish Leadership Council that there are two particular contemporary sources. First, individuals on the fringes of the movement of solidarity with the Palestinian people. Those people on the fringes of the movement of sol solidarity with the Palestinian people can stray into anti-Semitic views. How so? He writes this, Corbyn. When criticism of or opposition to the Israeli government uses anti-Semitic ideas, like attributing its injustices to Jewish identity, demanding the Jews in Britain or elsewhere answer for its conduct, or comparing Israel to the Nazis, then a line must be drawn. So Corbyn is accepting that comparing Israel, that is the state of Israel, and it's stormtroopers, the IDF, that comparing them to the Nazis is unacceptable, says Corbyn. Well, you see, that's not unacceptable, and it cannot be decreed that it is racist to compare Israel's behaviour to that of the Nazis, because it is exactly like that of the Nazis. Gaza is the biggest concentration camp the world has ever seen. When pregnant women die in childbirth at checkpoints and are laughed at by IDF soldiers, well, that's a bit SS-like, isn't it? So the comparison 
holds up. So you can't say that people comparing Israel to the Nazis are racist. Jezza, what's happened to Corbyn at all? So he goes on to write Corbyn that anti-Zionism isn't in itself anti-Semitic and many Jews themselves are not Zionist, blah, blah, blah. But there are a very few who are drawn to the Palestinian question precisely because it affords an opportunity to express hostility to Jewish people in a respectable setting. So now Corbyn is opening the gate to those who blog about, who write about in newspapers, not so many anymore, to those who make videos on YouTube condemning the brutal, murderous Israeli regime and its treatment of the Palestinian people. Now Corbyn has opened the door to those people being accused of, ah, well, you don't really mean it. Well, you really hate the Jews. And you're just using the Palestinian situation to hide the fact that, well, well, you hate the Jews. Oh, Jeremy, Jeremy, what have you done? He goes on to talk about capitalism and imperialism and conspiracies and Jewish bankers and sinister global forces in his article. And he talks about embarking on a program of political education to deepen Labour members' understanding of what anti-Semitism is and how to counter it. Jeremy Corbyn dragged firmly back into line today. It's wonderful. Now, he's meeting with the Jewish Leadership Council and the Board of Deputies of British Jews, as I said. There was a lot of triumphalism on the television today, a lot of triumphalism today. Um, here's Louise Elman. She's a Labour MP based in Liverpool. She identifies as Jewish. And um, can we hear Louise? We can. This is Louise Elman speaking with Sky News Today, Jewish Labour MP. Well, I'm very pleased to see Jeremy's apology for failing to deal with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. But he has to show he means it by action following that apology. Uh, we've heard good words now. What's he going to do about it? No, there are the big names, Ken Livingstone, Jackie Walker, Mark Wandsworth, but there are many other names not known to the public who are also involved with anti-Semitism and they've got to be dealt with. Do you want to see some of these people, including Mr Livingstone, thrown out of the Labour Party? I remember that was what Ian Austin called for in the debate last week. Well, I'd certainly like to see unrepentant anti-Semites out of the Labour Party. There is no place for them here. Realistically, do you think that's going to happen? That's up to Jeremy Corbyn and the National Executive of the Labour Party, looking at the evidence, listening to the people and doing the right thing. And to have all those people from the mainstream Jewish community out in Parliament Square was absolutely unprecedented. And Jewish people just don't turn out on the streets like that. This has been building up, building up the anti-Semitic mural that Jeremy hadn't looked at properly, well, really just tipped things over the edge. But now we've got to see action. Yeah. What we're very concerned about. What am I doing there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what I'm doing there. Right. The anti-Semitic mural that Jeremy didn't look at. <laughs> right. Properly. He didn't look at it properly, Jeremy. And unrepentant anti-Semites like Ken Livingston have to be thrown out of the party. But Livingston, of course, is not racist. He just said that there was a time. Do you know, I'm actually boring the shite out of myself. I swear I am. This is one of the one of the great millstones around the necks of serial presenters. You find yourself saying something which you've said a thousand times before, but you can't avoid it because it's salient. It must be said. Livingston said at one time Hitler wanted to get the Jews out of Germany through the front door and not through the concentration camps, at least in the early 30s. Let's get these Jews out of the country. Let's get them into Palestine. The Havre Agreement. So Livingston said, haphazardly, ham-fistedly, but accurately, there was a time when the Nazis supported Zionism. It is true. But he has to be thrown out. That was Louise Elman. Then we heard from Gideon Falter. Now Gideon Falter is one of the greatest Muppets ever to walk the highways and byways of the United Kingdom. A Muppet. I have no idea which one he is, Statler or Waldorf, but he's one of them. Can't think which he is. Falter is the world-class lawyer who heads up the charity campaign against anti-Semitism. 
You might be in line for a libel suit there. No, I'm not. I can qualify what I'm saying. He is a liar, a stone cold liar, because he has he has claimed in the past that people such as Ike, for example, David Ike, has denied the Holocaust when they haven't, and he knows they haven't. Libelous, actually, but Ike and others wouldn't give him the time of day by suing him and wasting their time with him. He is a stone-cold liar, Gideon Falter. But he goes on television on Sky News and BBC, and he's not challenged. Um, His charity, insert laugh track there, charity, is suing Alison Shablow for some very funny and satirical songs. Crazy. What did Gideon, the stone-cold liar Falter, say? Is he happy that Jeremy has come to heal? Because you'd have thought these guys would be breaking out the champagne that Jeremy has basically prostrated himself in front of the UK's Zionist lobby and said, do with me what you will. What does Gideon think? What we're very concerned about is that we are not seeing any evidence whatsoever that the Labour Party is about to start implementing fair, transparent and efficient uh, disciplinary procedures. And the emphasis there has to be partly on the word transparent. Everything that happens within the Labour Party at the moment is done in secrecy. We don't know what the disciplinary outcomes are. And indeed, over the last three years, we've heard about thousands, apparently, thousands of cases of anti-Semitism which have been referred to the party. And yet, we don't know what's happened in those cases. So how can we possibly be reassured, for example, without that becoming clear? One case in point is that we've actually filed a disciplinary complaint against Jeremy Corbyn himself. He's on, on, on the clip there saying that he has every confidence in Jenny Formby. That's probably because she has already rejected the disciplinary complaint against him and the way in which she did so was, again, another insulting whitewash. So we need to be very careful about watching what Mr Corbyn does uh, rather than listening to what he says, unfortunately. Gideon, appreciate your time. Thank you. We are out of time, I'm afraid, but thank you. Now, I didn't forget to edit that. I left that in at the end so that you could hear the Sky News presenter not address him as Mr. Falter and not remind the listeners that Gideon Falter chairs the anti-Semitism charity, whatever. Gideon Falter, chair of the campaign against anti-Semitism, thank you. No, no, no. Or Mr. Falter. No, no. Gideon. Gideon. Don't ask him any questions. Just be all pally-pally with him. So Falter wants to... He wants discipline brought against Jeremy Corbyn because of Corbyn's past conduct. It's crazy stuff, this. But it's all over now. And I'm not going to dwell on this because I've talked about this a lot in, um, well, in in the last 10 years, I, <laughs> I think, or more. So I don't want to dwell on it. But it's game over. With the capitulation of Corbyn, you're now going to see the criminalisation of talking about Israel full stop and the re-education programme that is going to be rolled out for Labour members as much as Labour MPs and councillors is going to be basically this. Don't ever talk about Israel. That's what it's going to be. Young men and women coming into the party from uni, a lot of them, some of them, horrified by what's happening in Palestine, will be told, listen, this is one you can't win. So it's best we stay out of it. So we're telling you, just don't get involved. That's what Corbyn has done today. When Corbyn agrees that comparing Israel and the Nazis is is a red line. Can't do that anymore. When Corbyn says that some people are joining Palestinian solidarity movements just because they want to have a go at the Jews. How could he write that bollocks? In good conscience. Well, he did. And not only did he write it, but he wrote it for the Evening Standard, which is edited by Gideon George Osborne. Yeah. 20 minutes past the hour. Very quickly, because I think you've got to be honest. Or at least um, you should strive to be honest when you make programmes, when you write articles. Sky News Today presented a series of reports throughout the day, which was... Uh, It kills me to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. First-rate journalism. Outstanding journalism by Sky News today. It really was. I sent him a tweet and I dropped an an email to their head of news, their head of um, production, to say, well done. 
brilliant stuff by Sky News today. Sky has been investigating the rollout of universal credit and how it's affected areas where it has been rolled out. Now, for people overseas, they might, might not know what universal credit is. There are people in society who absolutely depend on financial support from the state for very good reasons. Not scroungers, not work shy. 99.99% of people getting benefits desperately need them, need help and deserve help, right? And over the years, they would get maybe two, three, four, maybe five different payments during the course of a month. So they might get unemployment assistance, they might get a payment towards fuel costs, gas and electricity. There are other payments. What the government decided to do was roll all of these payments into one payment and call it, un and call it universal credit. So rather than the person who needs help getting a couple or three different payments a month at different times, which they'd become very accustomed to, all of a sudden they were getting one payment and the payment had been reduced. So they were getting less and they were getting it all in the one go. There were warnings coming from every section of society, from charities, from from organisations that work with poor people. They said, this is a disaster. It's going to destroy people. It's going to see people lose their homes. It's going to plunge people into absolute poverty. They're going to be hungry and they're going to lose their houses. Their state-owned affordable housing, the, 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 the houses they rent. Well, wouldn't you know it, Sky News has done some amazing reporting. Can't believe it. And they have found that, yes, rent arrears, evictions and food bank usage are soaring, soaring even in areas where this universal credit programme has been rolled out. And today, every half hour, they were live in places like Oldham, speaking with activists, interviewing people who need and rely on state assistance and are dependent on the state to live effectively and showing what's happening to those people since they began to roll out this new system. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's called, um, Sky have called it the Line 18 Investigation into Welfare. And it's running on Sky and presumably on Sky News' YouTube channel. You'll find the recording of it at some stage today or tomorrow. Watch it. Fair play to Sky. Round of applause. Proper journalism. We spend enough time here criticising their content and criticising their presenters. What their report shows is the Hunger Games society agenda is moving on at a rate of knots and it is destroying people's lives, but not on a small scale, on a gigantic scale. And I'm sure Tommy Sheridan will have something to say about that when he joins us live from Scotland in a minute. Finally, for the moment, there's lots I want to talk about, but I'm mindful of the fact that I'm supposed to be ringing Tommy in about seven or eight minutes' time. Facebook has launched a fresh drive to root out race, hate, extremism and fake news from its platform. This is interesting. It has, Facebook has published new guidelines on the standards it expects from people who use it and it has urged people to, quote, share responsibly. And Sky News spoke with a woman called Siobhan Comiskey. She's an Irish woman and she's Facebook's head of policy for Europe. In fact, she's Facebook's head of policy for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. And she says, we absolutely do have the interests of the community of people who use Facebook at heart. Safety is really important to us. And that's why we are publishing this new set of community standards. This is Siobhan Comiskey, the head of policy at Facebook, public policy, Europe, Middle East and Africa. Here's Siobhan Comiskey. Firstly, we do not allow hate speech on Facebook. And we define but it's that... There, isn't it? We do not allow hate speech on Facebook and we define it as content that directly attacks people on the basis of, for example, their race, their religion, their nationality. So what we do is we're investing heavily in both technology and people to address this. Your reputation has, has taken a real battering here. How can you convince your users that actually you have their interests at heart that you've changed? We absolutely do have the interests of our the community of people who use Facebook at heart and safety is really important to us and that's really what today is all about. 
A key priority for Facebook is the identification and removal of extremist posts, the kind of content that helped radicalise the man who drove a van into a crowd of Muslim worshippers in North London last year. The company says it will also tackle false or fake news, but that won't involve the removal of the majority of those stories. All it seems you're doing is putting them further down your news feed. That doesn't sound like decisive action to tackle them. We have a number of strategies for dealing with false news and misinformation. One of the ways that we tackle it is community education. So it's really important that people are able to recognise what is false news and misinformation. But if it's on your news feed, surely that's confusing. Well, one of the ways that we're tackling it is we're getting to the root of it, and this is really important. We are getting to the root of false news, and we're doing that by tackling the fake accounts that are producing it. For Facebook, there is still an obvious contradiction. A desire to tackle fake and problem content set against a business model that's designed to feed users what they want to see. Did you hear that last bit? Because this is very important. It's one of the most important things to understand about Facebook and about Twitter. It's a model that is designed to present people with what they want to see. And that's what it does. And it will continue to present people with information that they want to see because it is a form of control, because it keeps people calm. It keeps people in a state of flux, in a state of inaction or non-action. This is the genius of Facebook. This is what the term echo chamber means. And people become more and more insular, more inward looking, even more narcissistic to begin to seek out in their life or their lives in general because of the, I would say, the mass mind control program that Facebook is inflicting on people. In the rest of their lives then, they find themselves seeking out only those who agree with them. Only those who see eye to eye with them on whatever issue. This is the this is the whole thing. And he said it right there, the Sky News reporter. Its model is built around telling you what you want to hear. 